I enjoyed your talk very, very much. And uh, I've ended up liking you lots, lots more than I did the first time I came to one of these. Uh, We're moving in the right direction. So I, pr I appreciate that. Maybe. Uh, yeah. right. I was struck by uh, your uh, part of the conversation about politicians and the impossibility of getting elected without professing some kinds of kind of belief. Uh -huh. And I find myself kind of in a dilemma. Um, I saw an interview with the Democratic nominee a while back uh, where he suggests, he said that every day he talked to Christ, prayed to Christ, right. and sometimes he heard an answer and sometimes it was faint. And so I, I have the dilemma, I either take him at his word or uh, I have to think how cynical could you be to profess such a thing, and, and that would bother me. So I'm kind of in the middle and thinking, well, maybe he does believe part of that. How, how do you react to what we hear from politicians talking this way? Well, it, I mean, part of it is that certainly that's possible that someone is uh, cynically just saying what they think they need to say uh, in order to pander to the religious commitments of their neighbors that they don't share. Um, and there, there's certainly some people who I think are just kind of connecting the dots there and, and often doing it badly and, and people sense that they're not, I think, uh, ironically, I think McCain is probably doing that more than anyone in this election. Um, I think he's probably the least honest in, in espousing his, his uh, religious commitment. Um, but I think the deeper problem is that we just, you know, we never push on those uh, utterances when normal people, psychologically healthy people, talk about talking to God. Right? People, you know, people are just thinking, you know, and they think that they get this, you know, warm glow in certain contexts and they associate it with uh, uh, some religious truth. And we've never, um, we've never demanded any kind of sophistication in how people know, talk about the flow of their own experience. And we never, uh, we never recoil when people make uh, obviously unsupported claims about the veracity of religious belief using data of that sort. You know, I mean, people say, you know, I, I just felt this, you know, I just felt the grace of Jesus. Um, you know, I was praying, I just felt God's grace. What exactly do you mean? You know, I mean, it, 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 well, let's talk about oxytocin. Let's talk about the, the Muslim who's sitting beside you who's feeling different grace. I mean, let's, talk, you know, let's come at this from, from many sides. Uh, there's, there's got to be a, a, we just, all of that gets a pass. You know, people can just talk, and you, worse still, a, a, I don't know if you saw the Compassion Forum with Obama and Hillary Clinton, but this was, this, this was the uh, meeting that uh, was organized by John Meacham of Newsweek uh, where they were just, you know, d asked questions like, do you uh, experience the Holy Spirit? You know, and, and Hillary Clinton was led to say in that context that, you know, the, the, the tear she shed in a New Hampshire diner was evidence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I mean, and, and received no opposition from anybody. I mean, this was just, the, you know, like what kind of epistemology do we have where Hillary Clinton can get away with that? Um, so I, I mean, that's the situation we're in. It, it, it's a complete vacuum of critical intelligence when, pe when, when the conversation turns to, to God talk. Yeah. Right. I'd like to ask a question about a place where there ought to be a uh, presence of um, critical reason, which is Christian apologetics. So there's a long Catholic tradition and a um, shorter uh, Protestant tradition um, of Christian apologetics. And I'm, I'm wondering what your views are on that. Um, and I assume you think that they've gone badly awry. And how did they manage to do it when supposedly they were using reason to um, underpin their faith? Well, it's, the problem is just are you going to hold certain claims off the table when you start playing the reason game? And uh, it seems to me that most Christians, who are, you know, many very smart, intellectually sophisticated Christians, you know, from Aquinas on down, can play a, a 
a language game uh, that is uh, certainly attempts to be self-consistent and has all of the features of, of rational discourse that we admire, but it's in the context of we're going to take as axiomatic the fact that the, 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 the Bible was the sacred word of the creator of the universe. And so how do we square you know, the evidence of uh, paleontology and all the rest with the fact that the Bible is the word of God and Jesus is the son and rose from the dead on the third day. That's the, that's the game that most Christians are playing. Uh, the Bible is never put in play. You know, we, 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 never, we never see Christians looking. I mean, they, we don't see this because they, cease, they tend to cease to be Christians if they actually do this. They, we never see them looking at the fossil record and at, at uh, the wealth of evidence of, of um, pre-evolution coming from molecular biology and, and uh, um, the distribution of, of uh, animals uh, across the Earth's surface. We, they never look at those facts and then come back to the Bible and say, well, what's given that this is the way the world is, what's the likelihood that an omniscient being described it this way? You know, I mean, this is, then the Bible just falls apart. I mean, it's, the Bible is, is not even close to being something that we should admire as a as a um, um, kind of a a, man, a manual for this for, for existence in this place, um, and so too with morality. I mean, given what we now expect of, of our fellow human beings, you know, what you know, gender equality and and uh, uh, repudiation of slavery, and uh, you know, and now that we have people like you know. John Rawls and Thomas Nagel and, and Derek Parfit really thinking clearly about ethical problems, you know, and not, not that they all agree, but now that we know what it's like to really parse ethical issues, now let's look at the Bible and see, let's look at Leviticus and see just what God was up to. Um, I mean, it's, it's an embarrassment. You know, it's just, you can't, you, how could you do it with a straight face? It's not like there was nothing good in there, but I mean, it, things have gotten so much better. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's what you keep off the table. And, and it's useful to point out that Muslims are able to do their reason game. And it's, it's nullifying of Christianity. I mean, they have their whole story about why Jesus could not be the son of God. Um, you know, that's right there. That's, those, are, those are mutually incompatible worldviews. And they're, they're playing the same, the same game. Uh, I'd like to get your educated guess uh, how far into the future before religions disappear, if ever. That human beings disappear? Religions. Oh, religions. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, I think it's one or the other, actually. Uh, I don't know. Well, if, if you take, I mean, I'm not particularly optimistic that it's going to happen in any short time frame. But if, if, you, if you take this, my suite of concerns, and map them on to uh, the kinds of predictions you get from someone like Ray Kurzweil, just, I mean, just how, I don't know if you know Ray Kurzweil's work on the singularity and, and just this, the kind of the doubling time of, of uh, uh, technological innovation. Uh, getting shorter and shorter, the implications of, of this on his, if, he, if anything like his projections are true, uh, it's something like we're going to have 20,000 years of cultural progress in this century, you know, as measured in, at the rate of progress in the year 2000. Um, that could be crazy, but if, so, if something analogous to that is true, then, then our ability to foresee just how quickly things can change is, is I mean, there is a there's a curtain uh, uh, blocking the future uh, there, and uh, or an, an event horizon of some kind. And so I, I really, you know, I, I can barely imagine what it was like before we had cell phones and the internet. And that's, you know, it's been like 5,000 days or whatever. Um, uh, so it's, uh, it seems to me things could change very, very quickly. Uh, but still embedded as I am in the present and seeing how intractable these belief systems seem to be in the present. I'm, I can't say I'm hopeful that it's going to happen in any of our lifetimes. John. I hugely applaud the 
campaign you're part of to change the uncritical acceptance of often very crude and very dangerous religious beliefs in the United States. And I've always been a bit puzzled how it can be that a, a, a society which is so leading intellectually in some things like science and philosophy can also have this extraordinary tale of feeble thinking. Mm. Uh, but while I'm hugely on your side, uh, I want to express a bit of disagreement with your take on 9-11. Sure. Because, well, and I, in a way, I'm glad you have the take on 9-11 you did, because it led you to write these books. But I have a rather different take on it. I'm struck by, you're struck by the fact that it was people who believed they were doing what the prophet told them to do. I'm struck by the fact that lots and lots of people who believe in doing what the prophet says, and believe in that religion, weren't in favor of this kind of terrorism. Mm. And if one looks at the actual things said, the statements made by bin Laden, it seems to me that while religion is undoubtedly part of the thing in the background, the deep sense of humiliation that many Islamic people feel because of things like American military presence in the Middle East, in places they regard as sacred, seems to me of much greater importance in understanding why they did what they did. And I see it as rather parallel to the way in which George Bush's foolish military adventures in response to it, sadly backed up by my former Prime Minister. Um, I, these also seem to me, if you look at George Bush standing on the site of the Twin Towers after the wreckage, mm. it seems to me that he's articulating a sense of humiliation that characteristically leads people to want to hit back. Now, after the much smaller episode in London when about 50 people were killed in the bombing of the London Underground and the London bus system right. by Islamic suicide bombers, um, I was shocked to find there was a public opinion poll in, in one of the British newspapers that showed that about a third of British Islamic people thought that Western civilization was decadent and should be brought to an end. Right. Now that's about half a million people. Mm. Now my response was to write an article in The Guardian saying, a society where people are so deeply divided to this degree, we should start talking to each other and we need a kind of Socratic dialogue between right. Western values and Islamic values. And I got a lot of denunciation from crackpots in the United States who felt that I was like Neville Chamberlain being willing to talk to the enemy. Right, right. But I also got a response from an Islamic imam of a London mosque. And we had a debate together. And we discussed what it was that we Westerners worry about or offended by in Islam. I talked about the position of gays, the position of women. He talked about what he saw as moral decadence of various kinds mm -hmm. and toleration of crime. But the sense I came away with, we didn't reach agreement. And the sense I came away with was that to try to uh, attack terrorism, try and undermine terrorism by undermining the whole system of religious beliefs is an incredibly long, slow strategy. Mm. I, I applaud you for taking part in that. But as a response to terrorism, it seems to be much less effective than discussing what values we share, how we can live together, and trying to understand and criticize each other but not going quite so deep as you want to go. Right, right. Well, it's a good question and, and very eloquently put. Um, I think it, it's not incompatible with, with my approach or, or how I view this. Um, clearly there are, there are, I just imagine, concentric circles of religious infatuation. And in the center, we have people who are really, really down to their toes committed to their religious principles. And these, these religious principles actually are different as you move from religion to religion. I mean, uh, you, as I've said before, you know, no matter how fanatical someone becomes as a Jain, uh, the core principle of which is, is nonviolence, um, they're not going to fly an airplane into a building over their humiliation or, or grievances because it would be a repudiation of everything that they've organized their, their life around. 